click there now. I would point out that you don't always need web sockets. Long polling is fine in plenty of cases. In this, we definitely need web sockets. All the web socket actually ends up doing though is proxying a message from the back end to the front end saying, hey, fetch the new stuff. And then the front end's like, all right, fetch. So then we don't have to worry about, well, is the back end in that web socket sending stale state? We don't care. We just tell it to fetch new shit from the back end. And then the front end just does another HTTP request for poll results. Yeah, thank you, Skadoobie. Thank you for the follow. Welcome. So hold on. Uh, watching for a while. Haven't written, but of course enjoying much on the beginning of front end. Quantity of things to learn is a bit overwhelming. Yeah, totally. Uh, what's the progress? I mean, we're working on the thing, trying to launch it soon. Okay, like you wired up WebSockets for it there, Anthony, and then you're just telling having the WebSocket tell the front end to do a refetch. Which makes sense, because like the refetch can then tie into your existing like caching and other stuff, right? The cost of sending data over an HTTP request versus the cost of doing it all over WebSockets, like, yeah. Yeah, exactly, right? Using the WebSocket simply as a notification mechanism to tell the web the front end to do something. Yep. And it turns out super cheap. Yeah, totally. And it keeps your WebSockets lightweight and performant, right? So you're able to respond with something quick. Uh, Antonio, thank you for the follow. Uh, we're basically doing the thing in the title there. I kind of just talked about what we were doing. Yeah, right now we're rigging up a lot of our type system stuff, right? So some middleware for the web sockets, but also just knowing like, well, what do we need as types of our messages and some of that? <laughs> yeah, no worries, Anthony. Thank you for the raid again. Appreciate that. We did the shout out, right? Yeah, we did. Okay. And yeah, yeah, have a good night. Good evening, whatever. And yeah, I went snowboarding yesterday, so... I'm all fresh. And yeah, I hear that about screens. Like, you ever get the thing where like you've been on a screen so long and then you go to sleep and you like your eyeballs are just like, they're closed and there's no light in the room, but you still see like the flickering of like the refresh rate kicking. Cause you've just been staring at screens too long for the day. I get that one a lot. I don't like it. Right? You go close your eyes and it's just flickers. Oh, so Siska, he is open sourcing his main thing, Kidder. For the most part, it sh it could. These monitors actually have like a flicker-free technology built into them, like all of my monitors do. Even then, I think there's something behind it, but I don't know. Yeah, I, I use pretty much exclusively Asus monitors because they have flicker-free blue light filtering and I, I think some other stuff built right in. Yeah, but it's not as bad as it would be, I think, is the main point we're getting at. I think to a point where the flicker may not be based on the monitors. It may just be my eyes doing their thing, trying to readjust. Yeah, they're so good. I always have it to three. Four always ends up feeling like too much. But the nice part about that is it's a blue light filter on your screen. It doesn't filter through into like my stream or something, right? Which I think is powerful. 
right? You guys don't get an inherently orange view, and I'm not on the orange view either, but even if it was, it would just be from my monitor as opposed to the signal being sent through, which is different from if you're using, uh, you know, Flux or whatever is built into Windows for blue light filtering. I like the hardware blue light filter built into the monitor. I don't know if it's actually better, but as long as my brain thinks it is, I think that matters. So yeah, for people joining from Anthony's stream and subsequently from Trash Devs, the thing we're working on. And a slow coder, Mr. Sir. Thank you for those gifted subs. Cheers. SL Zero Coder just gifted two subs. Appreciate that, man. Thank you. So yeah, the main thing we're doing, right? We have this app, and hold on. Let me do a refresh for you. Oh, our back end is down because I did some stuff. Hold on, I may need to fix some things if we're importing those. Might have broken things. We might be fine. This is my... Every endpoint has failed and within 30 seconds, like, yeah, you know what? Um, just give us a minute. We're going to fix things, I swear. Oh, yeah, we got to fix it. So access token does not ex exist on type message payload because it doesn't. Ah, uh, yep. Hold on. Yep, I got to fix that real quick. All right, so that's going to rebuild and we should be good. So yeah, what's up, Dalix? Uh, you got your new portfolio done already, Privan? Good job. All right, so real quick. Oh, still not up. Still not up. Okay, we needed those scaffolded, then we're good. So now if we go refresh, there's our loading screen. It's beautiful, isn't it? I'm a designer now. We go log in. Uh, where'd you see the started value? Were you saying over here? Because that's a different thing. We didn't do any of those drawings. Those are from OpenMoji. And yeah, it takes a long time here in local. It's much faster in prod. Not sure why. Ooh, that's a good one, Privan. Yeah, that would be awesome. You should totally do that. Okay, fear of code. So then, as a group, could we vote on what we're going to have for dinner? Let's say yes, no... No, oh, come on. There we go, I was going too far. And no, boom. So now we load up and we see, hey, we're having chicken Alfredo. So it's a voting platform. It's not to figure out what restaurants are new in your area or any of that shit. This is for groups of people to decide upon what they want to eat as a group. Family, friends, whatever. It is not a discovery platform. It's a consensus platform. I 
think a lot of the problems are when people think about food, they end up eventually on discovery. And that's not our problem to solve. And that's the niche that we're focusing. You just blew my mind. So yeah, Carlson, thank you for the follow. Vishal as well, Antonio and Skadoobie, and Project Replicant. Thank you guys. Yeah, welcome. And yeah, owing paint. Who do you owe paint to? Is that some, like, you know, financing system through uh, Sherman Williams? Why do you owe them paint? Paint is expensive. You're not wrong. Dyes are expensive too. Do you know why purple typically represents royalty? It's because the dye for purple was so expensive. To have something dyed purple back in the day denoted that you had money to throw around. Yeah, sorry, Wolf Turn. I should have let you answer. I bet. Um, yeah, Priven. Sure, just keep in mind you may be doxing yourself with it. Are you okay with that? Ah, blue as well. Okay. Makes sense. Uh, and yeah, you got privileges. Okay, just making sure. Okay. I like it. I feel like, um... Does your Spotify list actually make sense? For someone viewing your portfolio? And yeah, at this size, yeah, they totally get stretched out. When instead they should be like that, right? They get real big right there. But yeah, it's responsive. Ah, uh, okay, that makes sense for Van. I'm going to guess this is no longer relevant. <laughs> right? You're not even using Next anymore. And yeah, it might not even be the preferred approach anymore. But it's still cool. And I bet... Uh, hold on, here's the question. Do you actually get like traffic to that? Do you have to make sure you at least have like, um, like 301 redirects? Makes sense. Nice. Oh, dude. Yeah, that's huge. So you should definitely make sure that you got your like 301 redirects and all that stuff set up. 
Um, I didn't necessarily say it might not be preferred. It just means he's not using it. And the way he's generating his site map might not be preferred anymore. Right? O over the course of two years, Next.js has changed a bunch of stuff. The way he's doing something within Next as of two years ago may be totally, like, frowned upon by now. I don't know. That's what I'm getting at. Right? We just don't know. I personally don't trust a blog post out older than a year, in most cases. There's some, you know, edge cases to that for sure. But as far as, you know, something like Next.js is concerned, something technology focused, well, yeah, that technology may have changed. No, no, it's fine. It's just a tool. He's not making, or Privan isn't making use of it. But the main reason I would recommend Gatsby over Next.js is just because of the image manipulation. Gatsby image has a lot more that it solves compared to Next image. Whether you need that or not is up to you. But... I don't think there's any debate about the fact that Gatsby image goes much further than next next image does. It's up to you to decide if that's relevant to your use case. They do have the blur thing, but they don't do nearly as much as Gatsby image does. Yeah, it's more effort because they're not trying to solve the same problems. That's all. It's about constraints. What do you need versus what do they offer? Uh. So I'm, I don't have a good example of Gatsby image right now, but if you, we go look at Scully image, which some stoner made, we can go to components and we can see all sorts of filters, right? So there's a blur up that next image would have, right? Well, I can also do traced image with Gatsby image. I can do it with Scully image too. I can do this weird primitives image. Gatsby image has that out of the box. And then I can even do pixels. Well, hold on, Gatsby image doesn't have pixels. I wrote that filter myself. At the end of the day, it's about having something based on intersection observer and the blur up technique and a whole bunch of things that come together into, you don't have to think about that shit. You just add an image to your page and Gatsby does the rest. What size does it need to be? All that. You just tell it what size you need it to be and Gatsby will process it at runtime or at build time. So you can have your full size 4K or greater fucking 20 megapixel whatever, right? 20 me megapixel bullshit, and you specify your size with Gatsby, and at build time, Gatsby will take that giant image and crank it down to the size that you needed within that context. And then even there, it'll generate your placeholder image using one of these SVG techniques behind the scenes, and it'll add all that shit to your page for you without you doing anything else. You just add the shit you need to the GraphQL. That is huge. Never manually manipulate the size of an image ever again. Don't have to do it. Just don't. Yeah, no worries, Johan. And sorry for just saying, get out of here, go look it up. I'm just pointing out, like, if we entertained every little question about that kind of stuff, we'd never get anything done. Right? So, thank you for putting in the effort. If you have more questions... Let us know. In the meantime, though, hold on. I gotta use the restroom. It's like I just chugged a bunch of whiskey or something. And uh, I'm gonna grab another soda. So I'll be right back. See you guys in a sec.
Um, so yeah, Johan, I would say access tokens are not specific to WebSockets, right? We have the same access token we're passing over HTTP versus WebSocket, right? Technically, WebSockets over HTTP, so ignore that part. But we have a token that we have to pass in a different way, right? Instead of as a header on our WebSocket message, it's now part of the payload. And that's what we have to think about from there. But I do think, yeah, Johan, understanding JWTs and access tokens in general is going to be hugely useful. So I, rec I recommend it for sure. Uh, and it's using that Joe Bell placeholder under the hood. Okay. Well, uh, hold on. Let me show some of my favorite articles about placeholders. So hold on. Um... This article is good, right? But there was actually a Facebook article from years ago as well. So this one goes into how they were able to squeeze your preview photo, right? This blurred up image inside of a header for a JPEG as opposed to even like the JPEG itself. So this is where they get crazy with some of that shit. And that's the type of engineering that you got to do at a company like this. Right? It's so much deeper than anything you'd ever think of. And I bet some of the shit they're doing day to day now is just even farther, right? Like crazy shit. So yeah, that's one good article. And then this one goes over just some techniques you might do for it. This was about at the same time that Gatsby image was done, right? So typical like blur up. You can pick a solid color. You can do just a placeholder of a generic thing. And then let's go into like some of the techniques. Like you could generate a gradient based on the image. Ooh, that's fancy. That's another way to do it, right? SVG placeholders, right? This one called edges is really cool, right? You give the SVG to the client, they start drawing it. And then after a time you fade in the original. Boom, it's super cool, isn't it? Yeah, super dope. Right? Shapes here is somewhat like the, the placeholder thing. Uh, so keep in mind, HTTP3 is just a slightly changed version of HTTP2. And at the same time, it doesn't solve the same problem still. No matter what, you need an initial thing in the payload that the user can see while your other stuff is loading behind the scenes. All HTTP3 does is get around basically the limit to the amount of HTTP connections that a browser can have. On mobile Safari, that's like six. On a desktop browser, it's something like 10 or 12. But that's a bottleneck that some sites will hit. Well, we got 30 images we want to load from the subdomain. Too bad, only 12 are going to load before the next ones start. And that's why lazy loading is important. Only load what the user's going to see anyway, and that's where Intersection Observer comes into play. So yeah, this is a good article that just goes over some basic techniques for it. Uh, Intersection Observer is a browser thing. It's an API that's available to us that we can subscribe to, and when I scroll something into view, right... The browser is notified of that thing's intersection with the viewport, right? So intersection observer is a way of knowing, is that thing in the page or is it about to be, right? We can set the intersection to be anywhere. Did that thing pass whatever point, right? Boom, right? We're able to then say, yeah, we should show and load this thing. Yeah, your time might be off by like four minutes. Should be 16 after, right? But yeah, good night, Privan. Have a good one. So yeah, if we go back to this page, right, we do a full load. The reason this blurs up is because we're not fetching the high res 
image asset until this thing has come into view. So we have the base URL, which is our placeholder. And then we have an attribute on the image, which is the high res version. As we scroll into page, our intersection observer says, well, this element's in the page. Let's take the attribute we have, load it behind the scenes, and when it's done loading, we fade out the placeholder and fade in the one we care about. So that technique is basically outlined over here, right, in the Facebook article. And then this one's more about just like the techniques of placeholders that you can do. So yeah, really cool stuff. I recommend them both. I'm pretty sure I linked them both, but if you need the uh, links again, just let me know. And I think I should probably make a YouTube video about this, huh? Oh yeah, they're both fantastic reads. Check the Facebook one out, especially, because some of the magic they had to do to get some of the... Like, they had to squeeze the placeholder image into 200 bytes worth of data to make it fit within the header or, like, the... Yeah, like the initial request payload. Like, it's just insane to me. Like, the engineering that went into, like, the way they did it. Right? The way I do it is the simple way, which is just, yeah, you get an image URL for one, and then, you know, we go fetch the other. Instead, it's, well, yeah, while the big image is loading, we got the other thing as just part of the, the head request, basically. And you guys might wonder, where does he learn all this shit? Reddit, right? We do our daily Reddit crawl and articles like this pop up on it. Granted, this is old, so you're probably not going to see it anytime soon. But I've been doing something akin to a daily Reddit crawl since before this even. Right? So no matter what, just like a doctor, you're going to have to stay up to date on newest technology coming out if you actually want to be at the forefront of things happening. Right? There are totally doctors out there that haven't learned anything new. You probably don't want them as a doctor, actually. But they're making it work. So the fact of the matter is, I get to hang out, smoke weed, drink whiskey, and work on fun projects that make me better at what I do every day. And the fact that you guys are down to watch it just ah, blows my mind every time. Anyone who's been around since I first started streaming I'm a better dev now than I was, right? For sure. Exactly, yeah. It's such a broad field, you can't know everything. Nah, I probably drink more now. I mean, for a fact, yes, I drink more. Is there a correlation? No. Or technically it's a correlation. I would doubt it's a causation. At some point, you get to an age where, I don't know, fuck it. I'm not going to be skinny forever. And I'm not anymore, so we're good to go. Progress.
I mean, at my age, they don't have much choice anymore. Right? Any Anyone dating in our age range? Any of those criteria you had as a 20-year-old are out the window. <laughs> you know, meaningless. We're good. Oh, but they don't listen to the same music I do. <laughs> I don't fucking care. <laughs> I don't give a shit what music you listen to. I don't care. Listen to it. I'll bob my head whether I like it or not. Fuck it. But it was totally a thing I cared about in my 20s. So yeah, anyway, back to it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, when you get to a certain point, slow coder, yeah. Then it's about at least having a fun conversation. You're not currently playing anything, Privan. Oh yeah, they, they went to sleep. Uh, that is kind of a cool feature, though. Alright, so, yeah. Uh, we did a spiel for the people coming in about the thing we're working on. Yeah, at this point... We need to start implementing our... Request Validator. Right, is valid web socket request. Right? And the reason this ends up being different is once again because our payload has a different shape and we can check for the type and then use that type to check our schemas. Right? What it means is, is valid web socket request itself manages the schema that we're validating because we have a lookup table for it. So we don't have to actually do some like higher order function stuff for it, which would be, well, yeah, um, the way that we do it on other pages is we create a function on the fly. Uh, let's go look at a random page that requires auth. Um, and yeah, like a create. What it means is we have this function here, is valid request, and this higher order function generates a function based upon the value we're passing in there, right? So that value we're passing in there then gets propagated into is valid request and we check some other stuff. So if I go look at the inside of it, right? Higher order function just means a function that returns another function because the returned function acts as our middleware to be invoked, like as middleware. So in this case, we pass in the schema, and then it's available to the subsequent function. And we can do some stuff. But we don't have to pass every argument here. So higher order functions are a very powerful concept to understand. Higher order components in React, a similar idea, like worth knowing and understanding. For the most part, I feel like I, I haven't had to do a higher order function in React for a while. But they exist. Uh, and when I say higher order function, I mean higher order component. HOC, etc. Higher order functions I use all the time. Right? Because it's just a way of encapsulating a value and then not having to call that value on the subsequent call. So this allows us to have a function that satisfies any schema we pass in. And then we just make sure we can parse it. Right? Using the request body. Things like that. 
So it's a powerful idea. Good to get used to. And yeah, seriously, uh, Jack, Architect is really cool. Yeah, when I want to put this thing up in the cloud, I just do arc deploy and I'm done. Kind of stuff. Like, wow. That's cool. So yeah, let's get back to what we're doing. So it seems like we don't even use that because we do a query strictly by user ID and we pass that in. Yes, that one's good. So our next bit is we need another middleware that would be uh, export const is valid WebSocket request. And because this is no longer a higher order function, we don't have to pass anything in here other than the request. And... Hmm. Yeah, all we need is the request object on this too. Technically, we don't even need the with tables part. We just need web socket request. Uh, yes, it's AWS specific. Keep that in mind. But some of the magic it does for you, right? It's the Lambda functions. It's the API gateway wiring them together. It's the DynamoDB table stuff that we got. We do some magic on top that would be cool. And then, um, yeah, like even stuff like the SAM, which is, I, I forget exactly what a SAM is, but it's, I think, a way of grouping a bunch of like Lambda functions and other things together as an application within AWS. So encapsulating all these into an application that, you know, sums it all up is super useful too. Another part is each function gets its own IAM permissions, which means should you leak credentials from one function, you're not exposing any other function to those same credentials being leaked. Right, as far as permissions and things go. And that's pretty cool too. And all that happens behind the scenes, all I do is type arc deploy. Let me check on the tweeters. Oh, Sam's actually let you run locally as well. Okay, that makes sense. So technically, we get local development. Maybe that's part of what they're doing for us. But yeah, we, we get local dev already. That's Yeah, I assume that was something Architect was doing out of the box. Sam being uh, part of that process makes a lot of sense now. But yeah, I, I had no idea. Was my assessment of what a Sam is accurate though like it's the encapsulation of this thing as an application besides like the part i missed that you pointed out okay cool cool i just want to make sure that was that was what i thought but i 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, like, yeah, uh, that's my fuzzy understanding that has now been solidified a bit, so, thank you. Okay, so what we end up needing to do is valid WebSocket request. We can get request type is equal to rec.body.type. And we know what that is. So we know that's a WebSocket incoming message type of some kind. We don't know what type yet, though. And this is where we may end up wiring some types together, right? And what's up, Herodra? How you doing? So, const... Um, WebSocket request type to validator map. I know we're getting a super long name there now. I don't like it necessarily, but We'll find a better name for it here in a sec. What I'm trying to get at here is... Yeah, hold on. We're going to make this a type in which key is equal to a WebSocket incoming message type. And that becomes a Zod schema. Ah, shit. So it's maybe not a Zod schema. It's a Zod object? Ah, it still requires a type. We're going to say any for now, and then try and figure out a better abstraction for that. Oh, and this would be... Uh, Value of I know there's a way to do this. Oh, instead of doing the key part, I just do value. It. That's it. Boom, and that solves that. One. 
Okay, cool, cool, cool. That was the, the way we do that. I would have had to Google it if I didn't have an example ready. We did. Luckily. And yeah, some of this uh, type stuff is new to me, right? Like, I have not as strongly typed enough in the past. But this is getting pretty clean. Okay, so if we think about this a little more, request type, we can get. Validator would then equal uh, be equal to web socket that. And then this is request type. Right, if uh, no validator return Uh, oh wait, uh, common? No, come on. There it is. Attach common headers, uh, status code. Four hundred. Wait, and this is just JSON. Empty option, right? So if that, boom, then um, I need to look at how we're doing or consuming the validator in other places. I know we have it over in middleware. It's just slightly different here where there may be some common abstraction, but we obey the rule of threes, meaning if we're not duplicating something more than twice or three times, it's a fine duplication, right? Because we don't always know the abstraction we need until the third or fourth time we abstract it. And that's why it's fuzzy. Rule of threes could be the third time it's copied and pasted, or it's been, it's we have three of them and then on our fourth. So it's either on three or one, two, three, go, right? That is up to you as the developer to have that like fuzzy bit of, well, is this the moment kind of thing, right? That's up to you to make the decision. The rule of threes is once again, kind of fuzzy. And it's up to us as devs to decide, is it the rule of threes or is it the rule of one, two, three, go, right? Is it the rule on three or rule one, two, three, go? And that's where it's just simply up to you to understand and identify your abstractions. And yeah, what up, Kane? How you doing? Um, Slayer, thank you for that follow. Owing Paint, I think I said thank you. Spirits, though, I missed. Arkenstone, I totally missed. Carlson, I probably missed that one, too. I am so sorry, guys. I am missing all the shit. Cheers to you, though. We're having fun. So, sorry about that. Hope you guys are still around. Oh, it's even better. If you're not hungry yet, <clears throat> you should be. Look at that beef. Ooh. Okay. Ah, ah. Yeah, it's a good one. I'm proud of it. I mean, when people ask, where's the beef? I just grab my belly.
All right, so anyway, let me just ignore all of Twitter here real quick. Yeah, so back to our main middleware. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, Kane, haven't you seen IT Crowd? It's called Geek Chic. It's in right now. It's, it's very much in right now. There goes the entire user base for our calendar, and they got it for free. So just in case you want to not watch it, you can totally go watch IT Crowd and watch a show about programming. Right? I think that's different, right? But yeah, Kane, I just want to point out, like, we're here hanging out, we're having fun, and the code happens kind of like whether we realize it or not. And that's the best part. Ah, and that's what I was looking at the other file. Yeah, where's our is valid request handler? Boom. So this is the gist of the logic inside of it. Let's just grab that chunk and we'll probably end up changing a whole bunch of how it works. Okay, so this song's about to end. It's not the official soundtrack, but this first song should be pretty close. Right? This should put you right there in the film. Right? Possibly the part towards the end when they're on the rollerblades going towards the train station. Just wait for it to kick in. It's not quite... But did do But you know, you know that song. This one ends up hitting the same vibes, though. And anyone who's seen that movie, Hackers, knows I fucking nailed it on that representation of that song, didn't I? Damn right. I'm basically the dude from Police Academy at this point. Doing the sound effects and shit. Michael Winslow. I got the sweeps, I got the bleeps, and I got the creeps. The what, the what, and the what? You know, the bleeps. Sweeps. And the creeps. <laughs> I, I'm fucking up the sounds, but you know the bit. All right? Just saying. Hell yeah, Johan. You got the reference. Types. It's in the name, Jode. It's the main difference between the words in general.
sir, do you think we're being too literal? No. He asked us to comb the desert. We're combing the desert. 